Pharisee has a zeal to obey God's law. They were very serious about every command God has laid out in the Old Testament. Judaism teaches that Old Testament has 613 commandments, 248 do's, and 265 don'ts. The Pharisee were a religious group uh, of around 6,000 men committed to obeying every single command. When one became a Pharisee, he pledged, he pledged in front of three witnesses to uphold every detail of the law for the rest of his life. He is morally upstanding. If you ask him a question and he responds, you can believe him. Teachers can leave a Pharisee in the room alone while taking a test and the Pharisee won't cheat. If you had a Pharisee for a kid, you would be thrilled to have a Pharisee for a kid. He would be serious about obedience. Clean your room. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Stop running around the house. I will. Do your homework right away. He is called the ruler of Jews. Most likely, Nicodemus is a member of the Sanhedrin. If you were to combine the United States Senate with the Supreme Court, serve as the governing body of the nation, and Nicodemus would be one of them. With these credentials, one might expect Nicodemus to be arrogant, but when he speaks to Jesus, he is kind and respectful. He addresses Jesus as rabbi, means teacher, and a title of respect. It's a title Nicodemus would have been called by regularly. By calling Jesus rabbi, he greets Jesus as his very own equal. He says, rabbi, we know you are a teacher, as he goes on to say in verse 2. Nicodemus, for no one could perform miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him, You're turning water into wine, healing the governor official's son. You healed a paralyzed man. You, you, you healed a blind man. Now he can see. You calming a stormy sea. You raising Lazarus from the dead. Or, or he may have heard the many truths Jesus spoke as well. I am the, the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection of the light. All of which have seemed to trigger a driving question. Who are you? Perhaps you've asked that yourself beneath his words of affirmation and wonderment. Who are you? God may have performed some wondrous works in your life. And you may have sat still in your chair and said, Lord, thank you. Who are you? You are God. Nicodemus appears to be investigating Jesus' identity, to which Jesus replied. In verse 3, he says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, in effect, your religious credentials aren't good enough to get you to heaven. The only way to get to heaven is to be born again. Try to picture Nicodemus' face at this news. There would be no hiding the look of shock and amazement. This man with all these religious credentials. What do you mean? With all that I've done, how could I be excluded from God's kingdom? Jesus is swinging a sledgehammer and shattering the foundation that Nicodemus is standing on. Nicodemus has lived his entire life assuming his religious credentials guarantee him a place in God's kingdom. And now... Jesus essentially says, sorry, Nick, you're wrong. You aren't good enough to get in. Jesus, in essence, told Nicodemus that all his years of progressing in Judaism, all the time he spent reciting prayers and participating in festivals, accounted for nothing. Oh, they laid the, the groundwork and the foundation, if you will, for the truths of Jesus was presenting, but they didn't have the strength to carry Nicodemus to salvation. And Nicodemus responded now as we walk through this narrative in verse 4. He says, so, so how can someone be born when they are old? 
Surely they could not enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Nicodemus was certain Jesus did not mean something absurd such as reincarnation or a second physical birth, but yet he did not grasp the nature of regeneration. Jesus replied to him in verse 5 and 6. He says, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is it with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus here is, is flipping Nicodemus' theology upside down. Nicodemus thought entering God's kingdom had everything to do with a physical birth. If a person was born a Jew, he would automatically have a spot in God's kingdom. He would only be kept out if he were blasphemous or extremely wicked. But Jesus says the opposite. No matter who a person is, automatically they could be kept out by sin. He or she would not only be allowed into God's heavenly realms if this person gives their life to Jesus. In essence, God said you need to be clean on the inside washed with water. You need your heart to come alive by my spirit. Then and only then will you be able to obey me. The Pharisees thought God wanted a radical external conformity and they missed the promise of radical internal transformation. God said, I don't want you to clean yourself up. I want to make you brand new. God is not interested in our personal remodeling projects. Nip and tuck and pull and push and wrap and flip. Billion dollar industry is spent on the external. Nicodemus was floored by this news, but, but Jesus explains how this new birth happens here. Now in verse 7 through 8, he says, you should not be surprised by my saying, the man with credentials. You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it's with everyone born of the Spirit. The new birth is the sovereign work of the Spirit of God, which is unmistakably evident in a person's life. Jesus uses the wind to illustrate the spirit work. He says that the wind blows where it pleases and so does the spirit. In other words, you can't do anything to make yourself come alive spiritually. Only God can do this. You can't keep enough rules. You can't give enough money. You can't attend enough services. You can't memorize enough verses. You and I didn't do anything to be born physically, and we can't do anything to be born spiritually except him as our personal Lord and Savior. But you can pray for God to send his spirit like the wind and blow through your dead heart and make you alive. The new birth is a sovereign work of God's spirit, and it is an evident work of God's spirit. We may not know where the wind is coming from, where it's going, or why it's blowing, but we know when it's been somewhere. Hurricane Harvey, several years ago, hit Houston, right? There were a lot of places in Houston. I was not there at the present time that Hurricane Harvey touched down. But driving through the streets and the roads, I knew that something happened in those particular areas. The wind came and the wind disrupted what was planted. It brought down what was built up. It flooded out what man manufactured. When the wind blows, it takes over and takes control. It's a reconstruction process. You and I 
We ask God to blow his wind into our lives. Change us, rearrange us, not from the outside, but from the inside out. Nicodemus questioned again in verse 9. He goes on to say, well, Lord, how, how, can, this, how can this be? How can this be? Jesus answers a question in verses 9 through 15. He says, God provided his uplifted son on the cross. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people don't accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Nicodemus came by night, and he was still in the dark. He could not understand the new birth after Jesus explained it to him. Our Lord stated clearly that Nicodemus' knowledge of the Old Testament should have given him the light he needed. You are a teacher. Well, what was the the problem, the man had education, he was a teacher, he was a ruler, he had all his credentials. What was the problem? For one thing, the religious leaders would not submit to the authority of Christ's witnesses. John the Baptist, scriptures, the apostles, Jesus Christ himself. The religious leaders claimed to believe Moses, yet they could not believe Jesus Christ. The Pharisees were more concerned about the praise of man than the praise of God. I have used, he says, earthly illustrations, says Jesus. And you cannot understand if I began to share the deep spiritual truths and you still will not believe. And to illustrate this point further to Nicodemus, Jesus referenced the bronze snake Moses raised in the wilderness. Back when the Israelites wandered in the desert, vacillating between rebellion and repentance. The Israelites were wandering in the wilderness and God fed them manna from heaven daily. But they began to detest God's blessing and mumble and complain and brought indictment on God for this no good bread. How many of us in here today, God has kept us, God has delivered us, God has filled us, God has given us every single thing we need. God is saying, I want you to write down all the reasons why you should be thankful rather than write down all the things you're not thankful. Thankful to have clothes. Thankful to have a roof over my head. Thankful to have food. Thankful to have friends. Thankful to have a physical church we can come to and worship. Thankful to have each other. Thankful to have a family. Thankful to have friends. Thankful to be alive. Thankful to be healthy. Thankful, God. They wandered around and they pointed their bony fingers at God and gives him an indictment. This no good bread. And after the indictment, God sent judgment through a poisonous snake that would bite them and cause suffering and death. So the people begged Moses to pray for them. They appear to have been more sincere now. And Moses begins to intercede on their behalf. God told Moses, make a serpent of brass and put it on a pole so all the people can see it. And if those who had been bitten by the poisonous snake would look up, they would be healed. Moses didn't stick the pole inside the tabernacle and even its courts, but because he stuck it not in this particular place because the law would not save them. Moses uplifted the serpent, was the only cure in the camp. So he put this serpent up and then when they looked up, they could be healed. All the people have been infected by sin and will one day face judgment, but if they look by faith to Christ, the one who has lifted up and bore the sins of the world, the very thing that brings spiritual death so you can have eternal life, 
Isaiah 45 says, look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Jesus Christ wants us to look up to him. The new birth not only brings this to a place where we need to look up to Jesus, but the new birth is the only sufficient credential that will save you. And here it is found in verse 16. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. This may be the most famous verse in the Bible. These 25 words may be the most famous verse in the Bible. But this verse begins with the words that's easy to overlook. It's the little word for. It shows us that verse 16 connects to verse 14 and 15. Jesus says he must be lifted up in death. Why would Jesus, the son of God, need to be publicly executed? The death of Jesus was necessary because God loved us. The death of Jesus Christ, the horrible crucifixion of the Son of God is a direct result of the love of God has for you and for me. He so loves us, he loves us, and he demonstrated in a real and a tangible way. He gave his one and only Son. We can be confident this morning that God loves us because we can see the sacrifice of something far more precious than time or money. The gift of love that God gave his only son. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. This gift costs us nothing, but it costs the son of God his life. God willingly gave his son for you and for me. And God gave this demonstration of love and his love was displayed to the entire world. His love for the world is remarkable, not because the world is so big, not because the world is so good. We did not deserve his love. We did not earn his love. We are rebels against God, yet God still gave us the gift of love in his son. Let us never doubt the love of God. You were not on the cross, God's own son hung there. You did not pay the terrible price Jesus did. When God was looking for someone to go down to earth and redeem the lost mankind, he called a gathering of all the prophets and the patriarchs. And while they were seated at the heavenly banquet table, and God the Father asked this probing question in an intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew, who can I send to go down and redeem my creation? Abraham raised his hand. And he wanted to go down, but God said, I got to shut you down, Abraham. You are a man of faith, but under pressure, you will lie. Noah began to raise his hand and suggest that I'm qualified, Lord, to go down. He said, no, no, you are a good candidate, but once you reach victory, you like to get drunk and take your clothes off. <laughs> David said, Lord, send me out, I'll, I'll, I'll go down. You are a good choice. David, but you know, you, you, you were able to unite the divided kingdoms and reestablish military and pump money into the economy, but at time of war, you're walking around the temple on the tower. He went around and asked, who will go? And no one at the table was qualified to go. And descending in the limitations of time and space, and from the beneath the altar stands the Lamb of God that had been slain from the foundation of the world. He stands up and says, send me, I'll go. Jesus makes his entrance on this earthly stage. Now this mission of redemption has now found its culmination on a hill called Calvary. It's Calvary, the way of sorrow, the Via Della Rosa. And Jesus would have to walk on this route to the hill of Golgotha outside the gates of old Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers would twist together a crown of thorns and they would put him on his head and the, the briars would crush into his scalp and blood would come streaming down. 
struck him on the head with a staff and they spit on Jesus. His face was swollen, eyes were black, and nose was bloody. Pilate ordered him to be flogged with bits of lead and stone in the whip and brutally beat his back and legs, ripping them to pieces. Jesus was led like a sheep to be slaughtered. Forced to carry his own cross, rubbing against his shoulders, and his shoulders became raw. Crowd yells out, crucify him, crucify him. Nails and feet are nailed to the cross. Every breath that he would take, it was a struggle. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. No greater love, no more that a man can lay down his life for a friend. God loves us this morning that he gave his precious gift of love so that you and I can receive the eternal gift of life. And even right now, you can receive what God has promised to you. God has promised even right now, he's promised you joy in the midst of pain. He's promised you peace in the middle of pandemonium. He's promised you what love when you don't feel loved He's promised you security when all of else is falling apart. God promised you strength when you are weak. He promised you rest when you are weary. God promises are available today. God promised that all things will work together for the good of those who love the Lord. So if you're here this morning and you have all the worldly credentials, that's good. But the most highest the most valuable credential that you need to have, you must be born again. Being born again has its privileges. It'll open up doors that no man can shut, and it can shut doors that no man can open. It can pour out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. It'll keep you in the midnight hour when you feel lonely and depressed. It'll wipe away all of your tears. It'll put running in your feet when no one's chasing you. It'll make you jump for joy when you feel sad. If you get, it'll give you all that you need. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. God wants you and me to receive what he has in store for us. Amen. The, the doors of the church are open and I want to extend the invitation as our leaders are standing across the front and in the aisles. Three invitations I would like to extend this morning. First invitation is the invitation for salvation. That's something that you have to do by yourself. Your mother, your father, your cousin, your brother, your sister may receive Jesus Christ may have a relationship with him that's great but you have to do that and receive him on your own he loves you and if I'm speaking to this per person today or persons who have not received Christ into their life that's the first invitation that's the highest most valuable credential to be born again, you can never receive. The second invitation is that person, I'm a Christian, but I don't have a church home. I've visited the church without walls. This is probably my third or fourth or fifth time. I've just, I, I, I'm, I, I still got to take it through the, you know, uh, think it over. Well, you thought a lot of things over very quickly. Where you're going to live, where you're going to go to school, where you're going to eat, what you're going to drive your salvation, your church membership, your church connection is important. Today is a great day on this hot Sunday morning.
to be a part of the church. Thirdly, if you are living here now and you have a church home somewhere else or you work here uh, for a certain period of time, we have a watch care ministry. We'd love for you to be a part of our watch care ministry. So without hesitation, without debate, without dialogue, the doors of the church are open and we're waiting on you. purpose for your life and you have a need to be in relationship with Jesus Christ and you have a need to be in a church home I don't want you to walk out those doors this morning regretting the decision to make this morning if something is happening beneath your skin I want to encourage you, don't, don't grieve or quench what God wants to do with your life. God has many things in store for you. He wants to give you an abundant life. I'm not talking about creaturely comforts, cars, clothes, or Caribbean cruises, but I'm talking about an abundant life of love, joy, peace on earth. Thank you. So don't leave here today. Crank your car up and say, man, I wish I could have responded to what was going on beneath my skin. I knew that God was pulling me and tugging me to, to give my life to him or even join the church today. One last time as the choir will extend the invitation we're waiting on on you. Come on, come on, come on. Stop fighting you. 
I'm going to stop running from you. I want to receive my blessing today because tomorrow is not promised. So thank you for being obedient to God's spirit. You know, sometimes we just got to move a little slow because we want to give people time. Amen. And we thank you, our sister. What, what's your name? Evelyn. God bless you, sister Evelyn. Yeah. Yeah, we, on behalf of Pastor West, Sister West, and the entire Church Without Walls family, we love you with the love of Jesus Christ. The person standing behind you is in our Decision Time ministry. They will escort you to a room, and they'll share uh, some biblical principles with you regarding your decision. We're so excited about your decision. Uh, you've made the right decision. Amen. And so, and so we want to pray with you before you escort it out. We want to pray with you. Let's extend our hands. Lord, we thank you for Sister Evelyn uh, being obedient uh, to the Spirit, Lord. I pray now that Sister Evelyn uh, assimilates uh, into ministry. I pray, God, that you would uh, allow her to discover or rediscover her spiritual gift and exercise her spiritual gift for the expanding of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you for Sister Evelyn. And we pray, God, your blessings, continuous blessing upon her life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you, Sister Evelyn. Uh, follow our... Uh, our leadership. Amen. 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 Now it's time that all of us have been really waiting for is that time we can give our gifts back to God. Amen. Amen. So whatever form you use to give your tithes and offer, you want to raise those up and repeat after me where there's a temple, there's a need, where there's a need, there's a profession. Where there's a provision, there is God. And where there is God, he supplies in miraculous ways. It's offering time. Amen. Good morning, church family, and welcome back to TCWW Trending News. Adventure Week starts this month, and we are ready to kick creativity into high gear on all three campuses. Visit aw.tcww.org for more information and volunteer opportunities. Now, let's tune in to all things happening in the life of our church. We are back, TCWW family. After two years of a virtual only adventure week, we are back and in person. And as you can see, I'm excited. Are you ready? What better way to spark imagination and kick creativity into high gear than at Spark Studios? This summer, we will learn that God's creativity did not stop in Genesis. The master artist is working to redeem, reclaim, and transform us, his creation, to the design that he has planned for us. Kids will see the beautiful truth that they are God's workmanship, and as they learn to use their talents to bring glory to him. So join us for a week of adventure on our Queensland campus, June 13th through the 17th, or on our Eldridge and Bingo campus, June 20th through the 24th at 7 p.m. To register or volunteer, visit aw.tcww.org. See you then. This Juneteenth and Father's Day weekend, calling all dads, moms, bring out the kiddos, all TTWW family and friends. Join us for Crawfish and Chrome. On June 18th at our Eldridge campus, enjoy an exciting car show full of classics, hot rods, exotics, plus fun and games for the entire family, and we can't forget the crawfish. This is also a great opportunity to find out more about TCWW ministry and volunteer opportunities that are available just for you. The fun begins at 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. And don't forget to invite a friend for more information. Visit crawfishchrome.tcww.org to register today. Fathers are a gift from God, and we want to honor our dads the entire weekend of June 18th through 19th. Dads, join us Saturday, June 18th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Eldridge Campus for Crawfish and Chrome. Then, bring your family to church on Sunday, June 19th 
for a great celebration of fathers and to honor our heritage for Juneteenth. Stop by the Fellowship area at either of our three campuses for dads and donuts and take your family on a tour through history to learn and share about Juneteenth. Also, in honor of dads and Juneteenth, we want to encourage dads to take a 2.5 mile walk with your family during the weekend in remembrance of the two and a half years Texas waited to hear the news of the Emancipation Proclamation. Visit father.tcww.org for additional information and to upload your favorite photo with your dad. Photo must be submitted by June 13th for our special Father's Day slideshow. We look forward to staying connected with each of you as we grow, gather, and glorify God together. Please stay seated for the benediction. Let's put our hands together one more time for the Word of God and the man of God. Thank you, Reverend Dallas, Sr. A credential worth having. What a blessing. What a blessing. At this time, we want to recognize our first-time friends. If you raised your hand or if this is your first time worshiping with us, we ask that you would please stand, gather your belongings. We have our first impressions ministry in the aisle, those in the green teal teal shirts yes they're ready to greet you and we just want to share some information with you basically an extended welcome because we know that you could have gone anywhere in houston but you came to visit with us thank you thank you so much i know i saw a couple more hands went up this morning all right Let's continue to encourage our first-time friends. Thank you so much once again for coming and worshiping with us. We don't take it for granted. All right, all right. All hearts and minds are clear. We're ready to receive the benediction from our pastor. Please stand. Look this way. I want to bless you as you continue in these difficult days and tough challenges. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face smile upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. And may the Lord bless you when you go out and come in, when you rise up early and settle late, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until that day when we shall stand at the feet of Jesus, where there's no sunrise or sunset. Be encouraged.
intro? How you in the intro? Because he kind of the, the, the intro. Oh, no, the awesome uh, not, not, not uh, the actual intro song. Because on, on that last hit, it's kind of like uh, what are we talking about? Nah, the last hit. Yeah, because that. Thank <laughs> you. 